All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks a lot for joining us uh, this evening for the third webinar, which comes under the Automathon India 2020 program by Automation Anywhere and uh, Microsoft. So this is Azhar and I'll be the moderator for this webinar session. So before we get started and before I introduce our speakers, our, we have some very well renowned speakers from the industry. Before we get into uh, the introduction and the sessions, I'd just like to introduce you all to the agenda for this particular webinar. So we'll be starting off with the introduction of uh, Automathon India 2020 program itself, uh, where I'll be talking about about, uh, what are the various activities and why exactly should you be taking part in this particular program and then we'll have our first speaker from Microsoft who will be giving a talk on uh, introduction to the Microsoft Azure computer and vision services and uh, then we will be having another speaker from automation anywhere who will be talking about uh, their a2019 platform and will also be giving a demo along with how uh, they will also be, talk, be talking about how can you actually build some really amazing bots, right? And also, so there is a, there, there, there's a session where we will be answering all the questions which are being raised towards the end. So feel free to shoot out any questions at any point of time. You, there, there's a question Q&A uh, box which you can see on the top of your screen. So just shoot out any questions whenever you feel like you are confused and we'll be more than happy to clear them out for you. Now let's quickly in our, our speakers that we have uh, for this particular webinar session. So we have Ankan, uh, who's the lead software development engineer from uh, Automation Anywhere. And uh, it's a pleasure having you with us uh, this evening, Ankan. And thanks a lot for sparing your time to shed some knowledge. And uh, also we have uh, Shandarya, who's the associate consultant from Microsoft. So we are more than happy to have you as well with us, uh, Shandarya, this evening. Uh, and uh, looking forward to a great session where we get to know a lot of new, uh, you know, no, we get to nurture our knowledge through your session. Now, let me just, uh, like I mentioned, so I'll be taking quickly uh, through the Automathon India 2020 program, right? So why exactly are we doing this and what are we expecting the developers to be doing from during this entire program, right? So we are looking where uh, for developers where, you know, they can build automation solutions that either leverage or operate on uh, Microsoft Azure cloud services that is using Automation Anywhere A2019 platform. Now this essential me essentially what it means is, uh, so Automation Anywhere offers an automation uh, platform on which uh, developers can build software boards that you know automates business processes. So we are looking uh, where people, uh, developers build boards that either use Azure cloud services like uh, cognitive services to solve a particular problem or they operate on Azure cloud services, right? So these bots, they are able to perform and operate Azure cloud like an IT operation. So that is essentially what we are looking forward to in the online hackathon phase, right? So let me just quickly take you on the scenario for the grand hack. So we have an online hackathon in this entire program and then there is a grand hack and career fair which will be happening on March 28th in uh, Bangalore Microsoft office and during this grand hack the top teams or the winning teams in this particular grand hack will be uh, you know we, we will be awarded with a prize pool of uh, rupees uh, 3.5 lakh Indian rupees and uh, so to reach this particular stage there are teams which will be shortlisted uh, from the online hackathon, right? So only the teams who are shortlisted from the online hackathon will be invited to attend this particular grand hack. And for the teams who are shortlisted and are traveling from outside Bangalore, so their travel reimbursement will be taken care of as well. Now, uh, what, 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 why should you be taking part in this particular Automathon India 2020 program is a question that might come to your mind. So we are not just looking for an online hackathon where we call developers, they build something and then they go away. We are also looking to, you know, upskill their 
knowledge in this particular domain as well. So for that, we have uh, different webinars and uh, uh, meetups in different cities. So one such webinar is this particular webinar, right? And uh, then the, the next phase, once you learn and once you upskill yourself, you are able to build automation solutions using the A2019 platform and also the Azure services. So that is the entire idea behind this program. And also you get an opportunity where you compete with other teams uh, in the quizzes that we have over Skilenza platform. And like I mentioned, there's also an online hackathon. So for the teams to reach to the grand hack stage, you have to complete the quizzes and also the online hackathon, because this is what will be considered while we are shortlisting the teams. Right. And let me just give you all a gist of the entire schedule of the Automathon India 2020 program. So we have uh, various other webinars. We are already uh, done with two webinars and those particular webinars are uploaded over Skilenza platform. So you guys can go and uh, refer to those videos anytime. There's a tab which says webinars. So the recorded sessions of all the webinars will be uploaded over Skilenza platform. And apart from that, we have uh, already organized meetups in Hyderabad, Bangalore, Delhi, and Pune. And there's one last uh, meetup which is happening in Bangalore on 29th Feb. So if any of you are around, then trust me, it's a great opportunity for you to network with uh, people, uh, like-minded people, and also the people taking part in this particular program. Right? And apart from that, we have the online hackathon submission stage for which the deadline is 4th of March. Uh, so by 4th of March, all the teams uh, should be submitting their uh, project over Skilenza platform. And I'll be taking you all through a quick demo of the Skilenza platform itself, right? Where you get to know how to form a team, how to take part in quizzes and attend webinars as well. And once, you do, once you're done with the online hackathon submission stage, then we will be declaring the results between 12 to 6 March. And then the team shortlisted will be invited for the grand hack on 28th March. And now this is quickly, I'm giving you all an overview of the cash prizes or uh, the rewards that you have during the online hackathon phase and the grand hack phase. So like you can see the online hackathon uh, stage uh, where teams submit and the top three teams who will be rewarded with uh, 50,000 rupees uh, for the first prize, second prize 35,000 and third prize gets uh, 15,000. So that is for the online hackathon stage. And uh, during the online hackathon, we'll shortlist uh, a few teams who will be invited for the grand hack. And those teams will be competing on 28th March in Bangalore at Microsoft office. And they will, the, the, the rewards uh, that the top winning teams will be having there in the grand hack is one lakh for the first prize. Second prize is rewarded with 75,000 and third prize is rewarded with uh, 25,000, right? Now, let me just uh, quickly take you all uh, through uh, what exactly Skilenza uh, platform is all about, right? Uh, and how we are hosting this particular Automathon India program. So basically, over Skilenza platform, we organize uh, various online hackathons or challenges uh, for professionals where they can compete. And also the organizations host those challenges, like how Automathon India 2020 is being organized. So so before we move on to the speakers, I'd like to quickly take you all through a demo of uh, the Skilenza platform itself. Mm -hmm. So let me just quickly share my screen. Okay, uh, just give me a minute. I'll just quickly share my screen with all of you. Yes. So, uh, so once you log on to Skilenza, uh, this is the screen that you'll be getting and you can find the Automathon program in the activities tab, right? You simply click on Automathon activity and it, it redirects you to the uh, activity page. And in this page, uh, so you can find all the details regarding the program that is the about what's in it for you and how can you take part. So all of it is mentioned uh, and uh, we have a discussion forum where you can 
you know, shoot out questions at any point of time regarding the program. Then we also have some really, really helpful resources which are provided by Automation Anywhere and Microsoft. So you can access these resources at any point of time during the program. And the timeline is available. And also, like I mentioned, you can find the recorded webinar sessions over this particular tab. Right now, let me quickly get uh, go, take you all through a demo of how, how can you register and form the team, right? So once you register, uh, so you'll be able to see a tab that says view stages. So once you click on the view stages, all the activities which are live uh, can be seen here, right? So you can just click on start stage. Uh, if you want to attend the Bangalore meetup, you click on start stage, you click on start and just you know confirm your presence uh, so the agenda is mentioned here as well and please make make it a point that once you click on yes you have to click on submit and once your submission is received you click on okay and then you end stage so basically when you click on end stage this is something very important that you have to consider because there will be two options one is the return later and one is the finish act so basically, once you click on, click on return later, you can access this particular stage at any point of time till the deadline is here, right? And once you click on finish activity, you will not be able to access this particular stage once again, right? So I cannot access this stage right now. So similarly, we have the next webinar as well where you can register and uh, then there's a quiz which is going on. So there, once you complete quiz one, you'll be given access to quiz two as well. And also the team formation stage can be found over platform. So in the team formation stage, you can either invite someone to join your team or you can send a request uh, over the platform itself where where you request uh, to join their team, right? So that was a quick demo of the platform itself. Uh, now, uh, let me just uh, quickly, uh, you know, introduce uh, our first speaker that we have uh, with us today from uh, Microsoft. So we have uh, Shandarya Madhavan, who's the associate consultant at uh, Microsoft, and she'll be talking about uh, Azure Computer Vision Services. And uh, we are more than happy to have you with us, uh, Shandarya, and over to you, please. Thank you. Hi. Uh, Am I audible? Yes, Shandriya. Please go ahead. Yes. So I'll share my screen. You can share your screen now, Shandriya. Yep. I hope my screen is visible. Yes. Please go ahead. Over. Okay. So hello, everyone. Good evening and welcome all to my session. And thank you, Azur and Skilinza and everyone in the organizing team to invite me to this webinar. So today our uh, main focus would be on two things. One is the main thing is just to leverage the Azure Cognitive Services platform for uh, creating reusable REST APIs of your machine learning models, which you can deploy in practically any application you want to, and uh, leverage all your cognitive services and intelligence. So the first part is something called automated machine learning. So there is there is one something called as machine learning and something called as automated machine learning. So the main difference is that in machine learning, you have to think of various amount of, amount of aspects or things before you focus on how to build a model. First, you have to think of how to process your data. What kind of data do you want or how what is the pre-processing techniques or just any processing techniques you need to use before you can reuse that data in your model the next one will be which algorithm you want to choose for that model it can be any algorithm for classification or anything for regression or anything for time series data so you will have to go through a lot of algorithms a lot of range of algorithms to choose the best one which would require a lot of time so the basic idea of automated ML was to bring a platform where if you have raw data, maybe any data file from your local or data file from your server or data file from your Azure resources as well, you can use that data and you can do any deep learning classifications or 
normal machine learning classifications or time series predictions without thinking of which pre-processing or which algorithms we use or anything in the accuracy point of view or tweaking the hyperparameters or just minute aspects like that. So let's move on to the demo. So let me walk you through how to create a service as from the portal itself. So as you can see in the Azure portal, if we go to your home, then you can see something called your Azure resources, your recent resources. You might be familiar with all of this. If not, then let me know. So you have to create something called a machine learning resource. So it is pretty much the same as creating any resource. If you if you have a subscription group associated to your own account, then you can pretty much access the machine learning resource easily. So the basic thing would be to enter your workspace name and then to create a new resource group if you want to, or you can use an existing resource group by going to the dropdown. And your location would be based on which subscription you have. And uh, workspace editions, you can choose for basic or enterprise for the sake of the of course, for the sake of automated ML, it works in both basic as well as enterprise, but there are some machine learning uh, services in the machine learning resource or the studio as we call it, which would require an enterprise level uh, subscription or a resource subscription. So you can refer to that from the documentation, but for the aspect of automated ML, even a basic edition would do. So I already have a resource in place. So once the resource is deployed, you might see nothing here as which would be useful for you because you have something called the machine learning studio which basically handles everything for your machine learning resource so if you launch your machine learning studio you will land up into something like this so this is basically where you can handle all your notebooks if, if you have some custom machine learning models you want to write and test here because you might need a gpu or some gpu based application or a virtual machine to run your uh, deep learning models or your machine learning models faster. So you can leverage the machine learning studio platform to write your notebooks and deploy it in a mach uh, virtual machine instead of your local machine. So talking about virtual machines and talking about GPUs, the first thing you have to focus when you're using the machine learning studio is something called computes. So computes in the cloud in general or in Azure in specific is basically a particular virtual machine instance or a particular platform or a host on which you're going to run your code, your deployment or your model on. Instead of de relying or depending on your own physical host for deploying your application. So you will you will not be having a powerful platform in your host for deploying complex machine learning models or scalable machine learning models. So if you talk about scalability or if you talk about speed, then using a virtual machine compute would be much helpful. So I've created two compute instances here just for the sake of demo. For the automated machine learning uh, resources or for the models, you will be using a training cluster only. But let's talk about compute instances as well, because you might as well use compute instances in your own code whenever you're using. So basically, a difference between training and a compute instance is compute instance gives you a full workspace for creating everything from scratch. So you will have, if you have this compute instance, you can pretty much deploy your own Jupyter notebook or your IPython notebook or your model model basically which you have written in python or any language you can deploy it in the automated ml compute so your training your testing and your validation everything happens in this compute so you don't have to worry about how powerful or how not powerful your host is or how how occupied or what what parallel processing applications your host can withstand or run so you don't have to rely on your cpus and gpus so the training clusters here are for the machine learning, automated machine learning computes or any other uh, services which you're going to use, which is not custom made. So these are computes which are main, meant most for scalability as well as for uh, deploying your applications and running it in parallel threads across uh, at the same time simultaneously. So you can specify the maximum and minimum nodes 
So if you go to new and there is pretty much nothing you have to write, you have to just write your compute name here. So in the virtual machine size is where the main thing comes in. So firstly, you have an option of CPU and GPU. So we can pretty much relate to it as CPU being for machine learning models and GPU being for deep learning models, where again, for machine learning models as well, if the model is processing a lot of data or the data set is very high or you have data sets from different data sources, then going for a GPU model, uh, GPU based compute might increase your accuracy. But for most of the machine learning models, we do recommend just a CPU based uh, virtual machines. And for deep learning models, rather, we would all only and only uh, suggest the GPU based models only. So the N series of virtual machines in Azure is for GPUs. So you can see pretty much all the N series GPUs here. And if you go to the CPU, the D series CPUs are the standard ones which are used for your machine learning models, basically. So the compute I have created here is of a D12 model. And you may pretty much choose whichever compute you want according to what your what is the amount of data or what is the amount of resources you have and how many number of CPUs do you want. So again, deciding a CPU would depend on, uh, deciding a compute would again depend on your uh, time in which you want to complete your training in. So if you if you are consuming one hour for training your model, if you increase your RAM or if you increase your CPU, then your parallel processing would increase, and because of that, your model would be trained faster. So de deciding compute is pretty much just your wish. So mostly, I go for the standard D12 computes, which is pretty much standard for all the machine learning models, and the next one is minimum and maximum number of nodes, which is for scalability again, like I told you. So the minimum which is prescribed for automated ML is one, because you at least need one node for it to run on. And you can go up to a maximum of six, which is recommended again, but uh, based on how slow or how not efficient your machine learning model is deployed or run, you can increase your uh, compute to more than six. So that is about computes. And uh, once you have a compute in place, the next thing you want to do is to upload your data set. So for that, you have to go to the data set uh, tab, which is there under assets. So creating a data set again is pretty much straightforward in your machine learning studio. You just have to select from where you're uh, loading the data set from. For in my case, I just loaded it from a local file. So the first one is you have to specify a data set name, data set because I'm not that creative and sorry for that. And when you go to next, so again, now this is a data store. This is basically where your data set will be uploaded, which can be used across your uh, applications app once it is deployed. So you don't have to worry about this much for this particular experiment, but just for the sake of understanding, you can understand it as when your data set is uploaded, it has to be stored somewhere in the server, right? So it can't just lie around in deep space anywhere. So your blob storage is basically an Azure storage, if not familiar with, is for storing dump files or any kind of data in large numbers or in small numbers or whatever. You can store it in your blob storage without a need of primary key or foreign key or any of the table schemas which you, which you have to follow in case of SQL. Or even in case of NoSQL, if you have to have the partition keys, row keys, or any of that, any of that sort, you don't have to have any type of schemas in blob storage. So it is basically just a dump of data which you can store on. So you can create. I, ha I had already created a Azure Blob Storage for all types of uh, purposes. So I'm pretty much using that. But you can create a new data store as well. So when you browse, you can browse your own files in here, and then. Once you upload, the next one would be to set your settings or to set a preview based on what data you want to use and when do you want to use it and what columns you want to skip or not skip or rows you want to skip or not skip. So it's basically just telling the model to pretty much use the data efficiently. So here, as I see, my first row is the first row which is considered by the Machine Learning Studio is actually my column names. 
So for taking it as a column name, you can just select this, a pretty much very simple setting, which will load the data set with the first row as its column names. And again, the CSV was comma delimited, but if it is not comma delimited, you can choose your own delimiter, which can be a tab or a space or a semicolon or a colon or anything of that sort. So once you're done with, with the basic settings of the CSV, the next would be to select your rows and columns which you want in your data set first of all. So there might be dump rows which you don't want in your data. There might be dump images or dump anything which you don't want in your data set. So you can just exclude it by just excluding, by not including it basically. And if you, if you have some discrepancies in getting the types wrong, type of the column wrong, then you can edit it here and that is pretty much the schema which you're going to specify for your particular file. And once you do, once you confirm, you can set for profiling. So the basic point of creating a compute before doing anything is because you, you will need the compute for not just running the experiment, but also profiling your data. Profiling in simple layman terms is basically creating a summary of the data which you can use anytime later on as well. But if you by chance skip the step of not creating a profile, it's also fine, it's perfectly fine. You don't have to create a profile of the data set every time to just create an experiment in automated ML. So I have a data set already created, but I follow the exact same steps to create the same data set. Now we have the data set in place, we have a compute in which we are going to train the data set. So the next point is to create an automated ML experiment. So here, when we create a new automated ML run is when we, we are actually specifying what data set we want to use and what do we want to do with it. So we already have a data set configured. So we'll select that. Whichever data set you create, well, how many other data sets you create, you can select, you can see them here, everything. And when you go to the next to configure the run, configuring is pretty straightforward. You're just going to enter the name and the target column will be the column in which the prediction will take place. So you can select the target column from all the columns you have included in your data set. And the compute again will be the compute which, you had, which we had created earlier in the compute. So just for the sake of going to the next, let's just create this. So if I select publisher, and then if I go to next, now we have three types of tasks which we can perform. So for classification or for regression or for time series forecasting. So as of now, automated ML just supports these three task types. So it can be classification or regression or time series forecasting. So, and in classification as well, you can in all the deep learning models as well. So what is task you might ask in this scenario is basically you're just giving it a background as to what kind of algorithms it can use in your particular data set. So the advantage is that you're just telling it to use classification, but you're not specifying which exact algorithm it has to use. So it, it is up to the model, it is up to the machine learning studio and the Azure services to choose which algorithm will be best and best suited for your own data set. So that is one of the major advantages. So here, when we go to additional configuration settings, we have something called the primary metric. Primary metric will be the metric on which your classification accuracy or your classification will take place on. So again, after once you classify your data set, there must be something which, which on which uh, some, some parameter on some metric on which the particular classification should be decided, right? So suppose I have two things and I have to decide the particular unknown object lies in class one or class two, but you need some basis and on which you have to decide, make the decision whether it lies in the class one or class two. So the primary metric which you will choose is just these, like you can choose from these. So the basic one is accuracy, but you can choose area under the curve, weighted graphs, or precision score weighted graphs. So weighted is basically just prioritizing between classes. So you, instead of having equal, priorities for each class, you're assigning 
different priorities or weights for each classes. So if you have a particular image, then based on the feature set, based on the features which is generated from the model uh, on that particular image, the weights will be added on the class and then the machine learning service will decide as to whether it has to go to class one or class two. So if you have a class with weights, then you can choose the weighted matrix as your primary matrix. Then the next exit criterion. So the exit criterion will be basically what is your threshold, which will be default by 0 0.5, but you can choose your own threshold here and the time it should run. This is the maximum hours, but not the, the maximum, uh, not the minimum hours. So it can stop way more, way less than three hours or it can run up to three hours, but it won't run more than three hours. So you don't have to think of waiting till three hours for your output. You can get an output before that also. So this is about configuring your experiment. So if we go to an already existing experiment, which I had created, so you can pretty much see there is a run. And when you click on a run, it shows you the best model which it recommends. So let's talk about runs. So there are primary parent runs as well as child runs. So a parent run would be a run which is for the entire application. And for every run, there can be multiple child runs also. So the child runs will be each iteration over one algorithm with different parameters or hyperparameters. So suppose it run uh, some, some model, any classification model one, it run for a param for a set of hyperparameters one. So it, and it got some accuracy and it got a model generated out of it. So now it wants to test against the same model with different hyperparameters. That will be a child run, that will be a different child run. And if it wants to test a different uh, algorithm with the same hyperparameters, that would be a child run, that will be a different child run. So in the same way, every run will have different child runs and you can see the models which it, which it has used for that particular classification of the data set and it will give you the recommended model at once when you click on the run. So the de deployment of the best model is very easy. It's the most straightforward thing. So you can download the model which will again download a pickle file for you to incorporate in your applications locally or if you want to host in a server externally. But uh, if you want to deploy it in an Azure resource itself, then you can either choose a Kubernetes service for that. You will have to have a Kubernetes compute or you can choose a computer, sorry, a container image as well, which uh, for which you just need a name and, you sh and it will create a web service for you. And based on the web service, you will get a, you will get a link and you will get a REST API endpoint basically, which you can use for use pretty much anywhere. So this is about the automated machine learning studio. So is, is there any doubts? I can take up doubts if you want right now, or should I proceed to the next part of the session? No, I guess you can proceed uh, to the next part. So okay. And uh, if uh, like, if I'm going too fast or too slow, then please let me know. Sure, sure. Please. Yeah. So this is about the automated machine learning model. So again, you can deploy any type of applications uh, with, a, you can deploy this with any type of applications, even bots if you want. So the next one would be the custom vision model. So for the custom vision model, you have something called uh, custom vision dot AI, which is basically uh, something connected to the machine learning studio itself. So you, when you go to customvision.ai, then you can just pretty much create a new project, which is pretty straightforward if we want to go through it for that as well. So, right. So if you go to customvision.ai, this will directly go to a platform which creates projects for custom vision. So before we move on to custom vision, let's talk more about it just briefly. 
so the difference between computer vision and custom vision because i assume people might be more familiar with computer vision is that in the azure resources perspective computer vision would be more of deploying a deploying a rest api with pre trained images which are already existing in the azure database so you don't have much control or rather any control on the images on which the particular rest api is trained on so the computer vision no doubt is a lot more powerful for things like analyzing your image describing your image tagging your image or any any of that sort but again the images on which the particular rest api endpoint is trained is has nothing to do with your data sets or anything of that sort those are pre trained so in here custom vision gives you the ability to use your own images to create models and rest api endpoints from the model which you can use pretty much anywhere so when we create a new project again the basic you have to create a name and everything everything but after that this is the main part where you are uh, specifying whether it is classification or object detection so for classification we have classification types where is it is it multi label or multi class so multi label is basically for an image you can have more than one tag associated to it or one class associated to it and multi class is just that one image has one class so in the demo i'm showing one image per class but you can do the same thing for multiple classes per image as well now domains so domains basically gives you a head start for your particular data set for so that you can increase your accuracy a tad more than what you will get from your own data set if you have related fields so the domains which are supported at the moment is food landmarks in retail and if nothing if your data set doesn't land on anything of these then you have to select the general so there are again general food landmarks in retail is again repeated in the in the domains as well which with the name as compact so compact pretty much tells you that whether your model is deployed in a server or a model is directly consumed in devices with less computation power like your mobile device or something of that sort so if you're using in mobile devices then the compact gives you a very light and less overhead model so that you can use in your mobile devices or in platforms with less computational power so that is about creating a new project in custom vision so once we delve into custom vision custom vision pretty much gives a workspace with three para, three tabs the first one is where you upload your training images so if you want to upload new images you can just go to your own desktop so i have downloaded some images of tomatoes also so the tag would be so the tags can be pretty much anything you can specify your own tag as well and if you click on upload then it is going to upload the particular set of images for that particular tag so what we are doing here is basically we are creating our own data set by giving classes and groups of images which lie in the same classes so after we generate all the data so we have three classes at the moment tomatoes cauliflowers and broccoli and when we click on train we can choose between quick training and advanced training so quick training will choose the pretty much standard uh, deep learning models which will be which will uh, be trained for these images and advanced training will go to the runs to choose the best model which cannot be the most uh, commonly used model as well so if we just train then it will go to performance so here in performance this is the one which is yeah so the iteration 2 is done which was pretty fast because it was a quick train model so you have three things which you work, which you get here one is your precision recall and your accuracy so precision is basically what are the actually right values which your model has predicted so the point being is that if you have 10 instances and if your model predicts five instances right and if only three are actually right then your precision is 
but your recall is five because your your you have predicted that many positive instances from what you learned. So a good balance between precision and recall will term as a good model. And anything in the excess or anything in the uh, lower end will will not give you a good balanced model. So for taking your precision recall and accuracy, you can either change something called your threshold. So threshold is basically a parameter which will decide as to at what point of your accuracy or at what point of your metric should you place that particular image in a particular class. So 50% here means that if any one of the class has a probability of more than 50%, which is predicted by the model, then the model will automatically assign that particular class to the image. So you can tweak the particular threshold to more than 50 or less than 50 compared uh, related to whatever you want, uh, how many, how much ever you want to set it to. And you can run different iterations to test whether it is making any difference on your precision and recall or not. And the other thing you can do is to increase the training images or to increase the dimensions or dimensions as in the resolutions or you can mirror your image or you can augment your images or you can uh, change the axis of the image or you can uh, do pretty much all the data augmentation techniques if you want to increase the training images but again you have to keep in mind that you don't overfit the models which are present overfitting is not a common phenomena which happens in your uh, custom vision models but that is something you have to keep in mind so once you're satisfied with your uh, iteration and your precision and recall then you can go to here you can click on here which will again tell you whether you want to publish the api or not so publishing is basically to create an own rest api endpoint for that particular model so yeah so once that is just a single click publish where once you publish your endpoint you can get your endpoints for two types of uh, input file resources one can be a image file itself and one can be a server image url so if you have your images in your blob storage or in your table storage or in any sas urls or any any sharepoint or any 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 place where you have your image stored as a url then you can pretty much use this api with these configurations as your request in your request so i guess in your in your hackathon or anywhere your primary focus would be to call these REST API endpoints to get a prediction prediction point. So I guess both of these use cases will be used equally. Rather, one can be used more, which is the image URL. But again, both of these are pretty straightforward. And if you have to anyway change the endpoint in the future or anything, you just need to change the iteration, to publish that particular iteration. And one common coding endpoint coding tip would be to keep all these uh, endpoints and resource endpoints or REST API endpoints which you have created in a separate config file so that you have just one place to change your endpoint and you can make it reflect across all your application instead of going to each file to change your prediction endpoints or your prediction keys or your REST API endpoints or anything of that sort. So maintaining a common config file would be very useful for that. So this was about it, about my demo of both the custom vision and the automated ML services. So if there is anything else you would want to look into, then we can surely look into that or any questions you have. So, uh, thanks a lot, Shandarya, for that wonderful session. So as of now, we do not have any questions from our viewers out there. But uh, uh, just, I, I, I'd like to repeat once again to all our viewers. So if at all you're having any questions, please, uh, please feel free to shoot out your questions. And uh, Shandarya from Microsoft will be more than happy to help you out. Uh, uh, and once again, thanks a lot, Shandarya, for that wonderful uh, session. It was really informative and i'm pretty sure it will be helpful for all our viewers while they're taking part in this particular uh, hackathon yes
And uh, now let me just quickly introduce our uh, next speaker. Uh, so we have Ankan Mundal from uh, Automation Anywhere, who's the lead software development engineer. Uh, thanks a lot, Ankan, for joining us this evening. We are more than happy to have you with us. Uh, and uh, with that, I hand over the platform over to you. Thank you. Hey, thanks for having me. Hey guys, I'm Ankan. I'm just working as a software developer in Automation Anywhere. Uh, so just give me a couple of minutes. Let me set up my machine first. Sure, sure. Hey, hey Azar, can you just confirm if you can see my screen? One second. Uh, not yet. Can you just share it once again? Yep. Yes, please go ahead. Cool. Okay, guys, so uh, let me take you through our platform, which is, uh, we call it as A2019. So this is the Automation and Anywhere's community edition, and this is totally a, a pure web-based product. Earlier, we used to have 11.3, that is the 11.x platform, which was a desktop application. And now we have moved to a pure web-based product where it can uh, talk to your local, desktop, your local infrastructure, and play around with it. Now, before giving a demo, let me take you uh, through a quick walkthrough for this R platform, whatever we have. So this is our platform. It, it, it looks like this, the community version. So if you are wondering how to go into the community version, you can just go to automationanyway.com and you can just uh, try the community version from there. Just fill out a small form and there will be uh, a mail will be sent to you guys with the URL to access this community version. And then uh, you just have to do a simple login to get into this page where I'm in right now. So we have the uh, left-hand sides where there are pretty much of stuff. So you can see the dashboards, uh, how many bots you have created, how many, the analytics and all you can see from here. The activity, how many bots are in progress and something like that. And you also can see your devices, the devices that you register in your server. So this is just like the server component. We, earlier, we used to have the client and the server separated, but with this web edition, it's all same. So you can actually have thousands of devices in here and you can actually do the load balancing stuff in order to maintain the loads across all of the machines that you have. That actually is um, a good thing once you are trying to scale across multiple systems together. Now to come to the basics. So this is the MyBots folder where you have, uh, uh, where you have all the files that you have created or else you can create a bot from here directly. It's just like uh, creating a, just clicking a simple uh, link over here and you can give the name just like as first bot. Something. And this will take you to a page where you can see three flows I mean, or, or the three modes, visual modes in which you, uh, how you can code. So you can just get rid of this and you get an entire page where you can go and develop stuff. Now you get the flow, flow chart based visual flow where you can, uh, if you're interested in developing in a, a flow chart wise uh, thing, you can drag and drop here and, and develop things. Or if you are not that type of guy, if you're interested in, in uh, developing in a listed way, just like we used to have in our 11.x platform, you can go over there and drag and drop some of the pre-built commands that we have, uh, which is around like 3000 plus commands that we have in here. So you can use this and you can cre create your uh, codes over here. Or if you're interested to see both of the views together, you can also do it by hitting on this dual tab. So this is just like a basic overview of uh, what our platform is. And let us go to the main thing. So I think Shondira has already described about how you can use Microsoft's API to uh, to achieve this hackathon, right? And there's pretty much of interesting uh, and uh, prices on 28th, I guess. So I won't go into deep into the Microsoft API services. I, I guess uh, that has already been uh, uh, spoke about in the, in the, uh, by Sandria. So let us take an example of computer vision API where we have the endpoint, the header values, and the body <clears throat> and what we are trying to do is we are trying to hit that api and uh, and uh, pull the response out of that 
So this is just a basic, uh, uh, basic API connector. I'm using Postman just to give you guys an example of how we can do it uh, with the Postman and then how we can uh, replicate this in our platform, right? So this is the endpoint that we are talking about and the uh, we are doing a post on the API and we are using the Microsoft's uh, uh, the cognitive service Azure API. And this, these are the headers. So there are three header values. It also includes the, uh, the content type and the subscription key and the visual features. So this, you can get it easily from the, uh, uh, from the APIs. If you go, if you go to the API and then generate a key, you can get it easily. And all you need to do is pass a body because if you're talking to an API, you also need to give the request uh, that what you are trying to do. So in my case, I am giving an image. I guess Sondre has already showed an image where she was doing something with the tomatoes. But I guess tomatoes are quite expensive in my area. So I had to uh, deal with this flower as of now. So this is like a petal flower. And this is the image that I'm using. So I'm just giving this image as a, uh, as a parameter to the API and then I'm just hitting the send button. So I'm getting this response from the API where it says it's a plant flower and there's a score. So in case if the score is uh, like near to one, it, it means the, the response is very much positive. And if it goes down, then, then it says the response is average or like it's poor or something like that. So in, in this case, we can see the response is quite good. And there are some pretty much other stuffs as well, just like the format of the image, the width, height and, and everything. Now, this is all about the postman right now. How do we replicate this in our, our platform? So if you go to uh, our platform, all I need to do is create a new bot. I'll name this bot as Azure Vision Bot. Going to the list, because um, I'm just doing the uh, coding in the list view. And here I can search for uh, the REST API, right? Because I'm just doing a post on the API. So on searching REST, I can see the REST web services appearing over here. Now all I need to do is pick up the correct method and just drag and drop over here. And here pretty much you can see the all of the steps. We have to provide the endpoint, we have to provide the header values and the custom parameter, which is nothing but the body that I was passing. So I'll go back to my postman. I'll copy these easy things. I'll also copy the keys. Yeah, so if you are doing it repeatedly, you can also write a bot. I mean like about which develops these things for you. And you can also put the body and the body is the thing which I think Sandria already showed that the URL, right? The picture must be in a URL format or even if it's not, I mean, like if you're using our platform, you can put some of the uh, image paths which you can call directly from the, uh, from the local or from anywhere, whatever you want. And some of the good practices when you're doing the coding is that you can pick up these URIs from the external configuration files or external text files, whichever you feel, because there's always a possibility where the endpoints can change the versions and every, everything can change. So if you, uh, so the, the correct way would be to declare a variable in here and to uh, take the variable from, I mean, take the variables value from an external configuration file. Okay, so this is it. And now we can see that we have to assign the output of this uh, API to some of the variable, right? And it only accepts a dictionary type variable. Now this was not there in our 11.x platform, but in 12, uh, we have, I mean, like in A2019, we have this type of variable, which is the dictionary. Dictionary is nothing but a, 
key value pair variable where you just need to describe what is the key and then what is the value that you're going to expect uh, with respect to that key. So I'll say response API. And you can select that you just want to take the output from that API so you can use this as output. Select the type as dictionary and you have to add a key pair value, right? So I want to fetch the body of the response. So I'm just keeping body over here and the value is blank because that's what that the API is going to fill in. And here I can select the response API. So whatever is the response will directly go into the variable. Now we are done, it's a single step command. And now what I'm trying to do is to print the response in, in, in here, right? So I'm going to actions and then I can search message box, which is nothing but the printing statement. And inside the message box, I can say, hey, I want to show the uh, dictionary variable that I configured in the step number one. That's it. I'm going to save. And let's see if I run this, let's see the response. So it may take some time, like because it's connecting to your local infrastructure, it's deploying the body into your computer and then taking the response out. So yeah, you can see the response from the API. It says category, name, plan, for the exact the response what we uh, what we got in the Postman, right? Now, for an example, let's say that you don't want all of these crap datas because you're only concerned with the name and the score. So what kind of operations you can do on our platform, right? So if it was simply a API heading, you can use any of the external softwares, but, uh, but why is it you will use A2019 or any kind of RPA services? Just like, because you can do uh, N number of manipulations in this and you can also connect uh, uh, various pieces of other services and you can make end-to-end -end automation, right? You're so we are not solving a piece of the puzzle, but it can be utilized and leveraged to solve the whole puzzle. Now for that, what you can do, what I can, I mean, what I have basically done is I just wrote a simple Python script, which kind of uh, removes all of the things and just pick, picks up the only set of data that I'm, uh, that I'm, uh, that I wish to print. So I've already created a bot uh, just to uh, consider the time. So this is the Python script. And in order to write a Python script, I went here and I just dragged and dropped this function called open, which uh, says that uh, you have to write the Python script over here. So I'll just explain the Python script. It's nothing. Basically, I uh, have Googled this up because I'm not uh, that much good developer. So I've just Googled this up to see uh, 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 how this works. And it's very easy. I mean, like these codes are available in Google. So basically if you are from non-technical background, it's very easy for you even to write a program like this, short program like this. So this is a function name, like read from JSON, and this is the parameter and you are nothing declaring a variable and you're loading the, just, the JSON in that. And you, uh, I'm just, uh, fetching the category object because the JSON response that is sent back to me is a JSON object. So I'm just taking the category JSON object and in that I'm just returning the array, which is the first, uh, uh, the first array of the uh, JSON object. And then in the next step, I'm executing the function that I have declared in my previous step. So the function name is read from JSON which you can see from here. The function name is read from JSON and the parameter I'm passing is a variable. So I'll tell you the, the variable might look different. So I'll, I'll explain you why. Because in the first uh, step, the response that I was guess getting, I was saving into a dictionary variable. And in the second step, I was just stringifying the JSON and converting it to a string. So I uh, 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 so I converted that to a string and saved it in prompt assignment variable. So this is the, nothing but a string type variable. And then in the script, it remains the same as is. And in the execute function, instead of passing the JSON, I'm passing the string that I converted in step number two. 
so that's it and step number three is anyways not required but i just uh, uh, uh but i just paste it here for just for explaining purpose so i'll come back to it and then step number six, seven six is nothing but displaying the value that i have from the um, that i that the that the python script is returning to me so if i run this let's see So in the step number three, as you can see, it's giving me all of the, the JSON object, right? This is this is the whole JSON object, uh, which is the categories, and then it has the name, score, request ID, and multiple stuffs. But my um, my objective was to only pick up this and not everything. So I wrote a Python script, which is executed at line number four, five, and then in the line number six, I get the message box. So this is just now, uh, this is only executing the line number three. So once I close this, and once it goes to line number six, I get the only uh, manipulated result out of that, which says this is the uh, name and this is the score of yours. So in this way, you can also change up the, uh, uh, the body of the URL and you can do whatever uh, thing you feel okay. So this was just an example of how you can leverage our platform in order to consume Microsoft API services and to build something which is really helpful. So this was just a piece of the puzzle, but anyways, if you are uh, using this, you can really solve a great problem out there in the market. So I think that was it from me. If you have any questions, please uh, feel free to raise your hand or I will be available. Just uh, let me know. Yep. Uh, Ankan, hi. Uh, so there's one of our viewers who wants to take a look at line number four and five once again. So maybe if you can. Yeah, sure. So line number four is nothing but if I just, oh, just a second. This is, yeah. Okay, yeah, so line number four is nothing but it's a Python script and if you if you are trying to create newly, I can just do in front of you. So just drag and drop this Python script open and just insert. I mean, if you have a Python text file in your desktop, you can import that. And if you don't have, if you write, want to write the Python script over here, you can simply take your Python script and just put it over here. That's it, just select the Python version that you have installed in your system. Is it two or three? In my case, it is three, so I've just applied for it. And just do apply, that's it. So your Python script is there, but it's not executable, right? Because you need still need to invoke this function. Now, how you're going to do it is that you can just drag and drop this execute function after you have described the script. And then you can take the, uh, function from here and you can say, hey, this is my function that I'm going to invoke. And what are the parameters you need to pass? You can just pass the parameters which whichever you feel to the function is needed. And then uh, you need to capture the result to a variable. So you can just create any variable or just use any of the available variables which you have and then just select on apply, that's it. So that's how you uh, create the line number four and five. I hope that's uh, clear to you yes thanks a lot so i he just uh, wrote down that yes it's clear now so uh, also i would like to put it forth all our viewers once again uh, that if you have any questions just feel free to shoot it out and we'll have our speakers answer those questions right away and uh, just so that everyone is clear there was another question uh, by Saurav Ankan uh, so mm -hmm. his question was where is the bot deployed and uh, once it's deployed do we get any endpoint uh, sorry the endpoint is coming from the API that we spoke about uh, and the bot as far as the bot is concerned, the bot is getting deployed into your device that you are connected to. So in my case, I am connected to my local infrastructure. So in this case, the bot is getting deployed to this device. So if you have a device, I mean, like you're sitting in India and if you have a device in US or even in Moon, 
And if you have listed in here and uh, who is operating from that access to that. So it's like a single chart can it the scripts in node.js yeah you can create it anywhere i mean like as far as you're uh, putting it in our platform you can create it anywhere so yeah all right perfect uh so apart from this uh thanks a lot Ankan, for that uh brilliant session uh and i'm pretty sure all of the viewers out there who are taking part in the automathon program uh it was really helpful for them and this will boost them to come up with the best of the solutions and we are also looking forward to some really amazing solutions. Uh, so at this point of time, there was another question uh, regarding the Automathon program itself by one of our viewers, where he wanted to know what exactly uh, do they have to build. So let me just uh, let you all, uh, all know that this is an open innovation uh, challenge where you have to use Automation Anywhere uh, A 2019 Community Edition platform and also Microsoft Azure services and build an automated solution. So there is no particular theme around what or there's no particular uh, specific challenge. So the theme is completely open innovation. And also the deadline for the online hackathon submission is uh, 4th of March. So the, we request all the teams to buckle up and uh, start working. And once you're done with your project, you can go ahead and submit it over the Sklenza platform under the online hackathon stage. So it is live. The online hackathon stage is live. So you can go and submit uh, once you're done building your bot. And uh, if at all any of you have any more queries, feel free to uh, write an email uh, to Azhar at skilenza.com or you can use the discussion forum over Skilenza platform and uh, shoot out your questions and we'll be more than happy to get them answered for you. And also the recorded session of this webinar will be uploaded over Skilenza platform. So if any of you wants to refer it at any point of time, please feel free to take a look at it. And uh, thanks a lot once again, Shandarya and Ankan for joining us this evening for this wonderful uh, session. It was an honor having you both with us. And I'm, I'm sure that it did help all our viewers out there. And uh, thanks a lot for joining once again. Thank you, everyone. And thanks to all our viewers as well for joining in. Thanks a lot, everyone, for joining in. Yeah, have a nice day. Bye-bye.